Good to see everyone, <clears throat> especially our visitors. If you would, please stick around, make sure that we get to greet you properly. As way of announcements, if you didn't pick up a bulletin, please do so. We've, there's quite a bit in there that I will not cover, but there's a few items that I'll, uh, just on a timely basis, I will address. As a reminder, we won't have the fellowship meal this week. We will have one next week, and we'll have a guest speaker, a speaker uh, next week also. It's not often that uh, that uh, I do this, but uh, Dennis Hawkinson got a Menard Service uh, Hero Award, and I haven't got a chance to ask him what that is, but but I got a feeling that uh, dedicated service and and uh, and just being a good guy. But I want to congratulate Dennis for that. I know, you know, Dennis, as some of you know and remember, was on our prayer list for a long time, and he's really come and done real good, and, and we're so thankful for God blessing him, and then obviously Menards appreciates him too, so I want to congratulate Dennis. Also, if, uh, again, if you didn't get a bulletin pick pick one up because I'm not going to cover everything in here, but uh, looking at uh, the ch classes should have changed uh, this Sunday for those that's moving up on the Sunday school kids. We also uh, extend sympathies to Donna of the Con Conway congregation. Also, those a lot of us uh, knew John Manry, Argus and May, worshipped at this congregation for years and years, and uh, quite an example to a lot of us. John passed away, and they're going to have his. Uh, it's going to be um, a service in the Marshfield Pavilion at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. So the service that they're going to have for John will be, again, Marshfield Pavilion at 11 o'clock. The uh, prime timers will meet Thursday, be finger food and game night. Um, as mentioned last, last week in, on uh, Paula's niece, uh, Marcy, uh, she's actually been able to take a low dose of this heparin and so at this point, uh, she was, they didn't think that she'd take any blood thinner, but at this point, she's dealing with blood clots. They have been able to give it, and so far that has worked. So we're thankful for that, but she's, uh, she still needs our prayers desperately. Um, I was real pleased and kind of shocked when I talked to Beverly early in the week. Nacho was having a lot of pain, so I was pleased to see Nacho here and been able to give a presentation, but I'm sure that Nacho and Beverly still would covet our prayers as, as well as Sister Judy and those others that's been on our prayer list for a while. Um, my sister-in-law, Lenore, she was able to come home and and uh, doing and doing good uh, after some quite a bit of uh, trial and tribulation on her operation. As Rick and Nacho mentioned this morning, um, they they kept asking for more and more prayers from more and more people, and I can't remember all of them, not even trying, but I wrote the first one down, Gloria, and then they, they kept going, but that work, as well as all the uh, sharing the gospel around the world and here locally, too, that those prayers are coveted and and. I believe God blesses not only those people that that we pray for, but sometimes I think He blesses us for just obeying His will in our lives to pray. Also, those of you that um, find it difficult or can't find a parking place up close, uh, especially our elderly or 
people just need a little help. Bobby asked me to remind you that if you'll pull through here, that they'll take and park your rigs for you. And that's, that's pretty good service. I don't even think you have to tip them. But no, I do. Seriously, uh, that, do take advantage of that. Uh, we've got, uh, we've got a, a lot of good men and women that reach out and try to help people in different ways, and that's just that's just a way of being able to uh, minister in this congregation. I believe that's all I've got, unless somebody thinks something I've missed. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy Father, we're, again, dear Lord, so very thankful that you have blessed us with this day, a beautiful day. You give us not only the desire, but the ability and opportunity to come here and offer you worship. Father, we pray that our worship is well-pleasing in your sight, that the things that we do are according to your word and to your will, and that they bring you much honor and glory. Father, we're mindful of those, all those I just mentioned in the prayer list. We're thankful for the answered prayers from Lenore and so many others, Nacho and Beverly, and Father Judy, we still pray for her. Father, we're thankful for Nacho and Rick and their ability and to reach those people in Panama, Columbia, Father, those around the world, Father, that, that each of us can be a part of, whether it's locally or abroad. Father, we're thankful for your Son who loved us enough to suffer and die that we might have hope of life eternal with you someday. Father, we ask you to be with us as we begin this worship service and help us take our minds and our hearts and Father and center them on you and your son and Father acknowledge what you've both done for all of us that we do have that hope of heaven someday we know we fall short of your glory at times and we ask forgiveness when we've happened to sin and fail you we ask you to strengthen us so we don't repeat our sins and we always strive to be forgiving of others so that you'll forgive us Father, above all, just help us to love you as you first loved us. And help us to be imitators of your Son, Jesus. And it is in his precious name we pray. Amen. If you're using a song book, it'd be number 147, verses 1, 2, and 3. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. He made him his very own. 
Phone number 324. After we sing the first three verses, we'll have the Lord's Supper. 324. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred air for such a one as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well, my the sun in darkness hide and shut his glory in. When Christ the mighty Baker died for man the creature sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Thank you, Brother Jerry, for that good song before our memorial service this morning. I got thinking a little bit about memorial service, and and we've had several of those in the last few years, few months. And then we have Memorial Day, where we go and remember. But you remember that when... Joseph of Arimathea came and asked Pilate, he said, I'd like to bury Jesus in my tomb. Now, I'm paraphrasing pretty badly, but he said, I want to bury him in that tomb, a new tomb. Can I do that? He said, sure, you go ahead. So that's what he did. And then on the first day of the week, lo and behold, where does Mary Magdalene come? Where does Peter come to? They come to that grave. Because that's where Jesus is, they think. But he's not there. And then we go over to 1 Corinthians. Jesus didn't tell us to meet around a tomb to remember him. He said, when you're you're remembering me on the first day of the week, you're gathering around the table and you're you're going to take of the bread which is my body, and you're going to partake of the of the wine, which is the fruit of the which is the blood of his body, which covers our multitude of sins. And that's in First Corinthians eleven, twenty three, twenty six. But he said, When you take of that bread, you remember me and the body that I gave. You remember my blood. So if if that tomb, if we could find it, perhaps some have. I don't know for sure. That's not where he told us to go because he's not there. But when we're gathered together around this table, he's amongst us. And that brings us comfort. And we can remember Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the body that he, that he gave up, unbroken, pierced, but not broken. And the blood that he shed for our sins. Let's pray. Dear gracious God, we're thankful 
for the life of Jesus Christ. We're thankful, Father, that he set that example for us. We're thankful that we can remember him at this time through the breaking of bread with one another and know that he gave that body for us that we might live forever with him and with you in heaven someday, which we look forward to. Help us to partake in a way that is honorable and pleasing and humbling to each of us as we remember our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we did not gaze into that open tomb early that morning. We 
did not behold the huge stone that was rolled away from the door. We did not stand at the foot of your cross and hear your cries of anguish. We did not behold, Father, the blood that was shed as a soldier pierced your side, but we believe, Father, that all these things occurred. And Father, we rest in hope that you're coming again because you promised. And Father, we hold our life and our very being upon that promise that you're coming back and that the blood that you shed as this feast represents now in the fruit of the vine that cleanses us from sin and makes us ready to be a part of your kingdom. Father, bless each one as it passes from hand to hand that each life might be blessed and we might honor you in the taking of this. In Jesus' name.
anyone overlook? We'll now take up an offering. Will you pray with me? Our most gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for this day, this beautiful day, Father, you've given us. We pray, Father, that as we have been commanded, Father, that we give back a small portion of the blessings you have bestowed upon us, Father, every day. We thank you for them blessings, Father, and we pray that we give back with a happy heart, Father, because we know that you love a cheerful giver, Father. And if we pray in your Son's holy name, amen. Is song number 71 in your book. Following this song, we'll have our prayer. As a deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart, desire, and I long to Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. 
Father, that we might gather here to worship you. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of our salvation that you have provided. Father, help us to never take your great love for granted. Father, thank you for being with those of our number who have been sick. Father, for operations that have been successful. Father, for therapies that are working. Father, we thank you for that. We would continue to ask on behalf of others that are looking toward the same thing. Father, thank you for our congregation here. Help your church to grow here and around the world. Father, thank you for Brother Rick, his ability to preach, his willingness to do so. Father, we would also thank you for our elders. We'd ask that they might be given wisdom to guide your congregation. Father, we would also ask that you would continue to bless our country, help us to be good citizens, and to do our part. In your son's name, amen. Song number 258. If you're willing and want to, would you please stand while we sing the entire song? Two fifty-eight, the new song. It thrills my soul to hear the songs of praise ye mortal sing below. And though it takes a parting of the way, yet I must onward go. I hope to hear throughout a number day the song her can. I want to 
There we go. We're on. Good morning. We're so glad you're here. Especially good to have visitors. Especially this uh, two rows up here, three rows of young people. We're so happy to have them with us today. It's great to see young people and to enjoy their energy and just recognizing they are facing a future if the Lord does not come first and we pray that future is in his service because the church is vital to any civilization and so we hope and pray that that we will be a part of that this morning we're going to take a look at the city given over to idols and brother Nacho as you see is here with us and we're going to also demonstrate part of how we preached in Columbia this morning if you were here you got to see the slides on a report of the actual work that we were participating in and we're going to follow that up with this lesson in reference to a city given over to idols and you'll see why that comes into uh, being as we look at the lesson but before I do that I want to mention this uh, for those of you on this side you're privileged this morning you get to see the big TV for the rest of y'all you got to look a little harder and squint maybe I apologize for that but this is somewhat of a test, too. I need you folks over on this side, if you'll let me or Paul know whether or not you see this well and are quite satisfied with that view, let me know. And if y'all are over here and you say, okay, this is too small, as you go out, just say, small, too small, too small. They'll know. And tonight, we're going to do something different. We're going to experiment again by moving this back and putting it in the center, Lord willing, and move the pulpit over so it'll be centered because the idea is that we want to know whether or not you can see comfortably from the back particularly uh, by using the one television centered rather than mounting two. If we mount two, we can move them forward, but if we mount one, it'll be over the pulpit. Much easier to see when you're looking at the pulpit and you're directing it from there. So kind of give us an idea, some feedback, if you would, in reference to how best it will be seen. Our deacon over worship is Brother Terry. If you want to let him know, he'll pass that on because you may not catch me and I'll be talking or something. So, Terry, we're going to let you deacon this morning, if you wouldn't mind, and I know he won't. We appreciate that so much. Also appreciate the folks that helped him. 
uh, acquire the, the televisions. We actually got two of the big ones, and one was bad, which is not unusual. And we had folks help us set them up and lift them up, and that, we appreciate that so much. But I want you to take your Bibles, if you were, with this morning, and we're going to jump into Acts chapter 17. If you've been here on Wednesday night, you know Paul's been talking about the journeys of Paul. And one of those journeys recently spoken of and was into, I believe back it's still in chapter 17, right, Paul, is in reference to what happens on Mars Hill, as we call it from the King James translation. And that is where Paul goes into the city of Athens and has an opportunity to witness their idolatry. And he is amazed that here we have a city, as you look at verse 16, given over to idols. And what an amazing thought here that Paul would go into this city and be overwhelmed with a city that's not just has some idolatry, but it literally is a city given over to idolatry. Now what you're looking at right here is a city given over to idolatry. It's buried in the mountains. Looks a lot like Athens. If you take some looks at the city of Athens, it's very similar. This city that you're looking at is Medellin, Colombia. Like Athens, I discovered that it was a city given over to idols. Now, verse 16, Paul would have seen something like, actually would have seen this, not something like it. He saw this in Athens. It was in existence. And the idols were even a part of their building structures, and they were everywhere. And so it was no surprise to the reader who had any knowledge of Athens what this city was actually like. It truly was a city given over to idols. Now also, we discovered, didn't we, Nacho? And you've yes. done this for several years. We have a city here. This is a core section of the city of Medellin. And despite rich or poor, and there's some nicer homes back on the hillside. This one's on the hillside too. But as you can tell, it's not a rich area. People put these homes together uh, just as they uh, could, build them on sides of hills. Many of them were squatters, right? Tell a little bit about that, Nacho. Well, there's part of the city. Uh, the people that live and grow up in Colombia call it uh, paracaidistas because they come in from the country or the like, farming cities, uh, farming towns, or from the other countries. They don't have properties, but they sit there they build their own homes and eventually become their own homes. And these cover the hillside in Medellin. Now, Central is more a, a popular, uh, popularized area, more people there, more established area, but the people as the city grew, they just built the houses on the hillside. At the center of every city, though, it becomes evident as I travel to Columbia that it was cities, not just one, not just Medellin, but all over Colombia, you have cities given over to idols. And it's shocking because I have never seen anything like this. What you're looking at here is a cathedral. Centered around this cathedral is a square. Like we have in Marshville, in our squares in America, we have city halls. This uh, is not the case in Central America. You have the cathedrals that form the center of, of, of business and cities and of course, those started out as missions when the Spaniards brought Catholicism to, Amer to Central America and Latin America. They would build a mission, and there they would offer up school. They would also participate with helping the poor and working with trading goods back and forth to Spain so the people prospered. They sent their kids to school, and pretty soon they're all speaking Spanish. And the community center around these missions that grew into cathedrals, and many of the cathedrals that we were able to see and that you'll see in the slides were built in the 1800s after the missions were replaced. Inside those cathedrals, it became clear we have cities given over to idols. They have brought over statues, ancient statues from, from all over the, the Roman world in, in Spain and have installed these statues, and it is amazing to watch people express their devotion 
to these statues. And that's going to be very important to consider as we look at Acts 17 because what not only uh, caused Paul to look at the city and say a city given over to idols, but he also saw a city that was offering up their devotion and their worship to these idols. And that extended, didn't it, Nacho, to not just inside the cities, but as you would leave the cities, as you would drive in and out, what would we see there? There's a virgin. They, they have different statues, so they call it a virgin, but anybody can stop and adore the statue. Everywhere we went, beside the roads, there were statues that people had built uh, to, to memorialize uh, various aspects of their, their devotion, but clearly you can tell that they were given over to idols. Here's another case. As Paul says in verse 23, for I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship. And so Paul was, was overtaken by the fact that they were not only those idols there and those statues, but they were worshiping them. And that's probably the thing that shocked me the most having my first trip to Central America was the reality that these people are not only, not only do they have the statues, but they worship those statues. They, they have devotions uh, regularly to those statues. Now, I'm going to have Nacho demonstrate to you when we were teaching and preaching in Colombia just exactly what the people heard. So verse 16, if you take your Bibles, look at verse 16 or look at the screen. The scripture says, now while Paul waited for them in Athens, he's waiting on, on uh, Timothy to go back to verse 14. Titus and Timothy, he wanted them to come, so he's waiting for them. And this gave him opportunity to, to see Athens. And then look at what scripture says. His spirit was provoked within him. El Espíritu estaba, probado, estaba provocándolo a él. And what was it that provoked that spirit? ¿Qué es lo que el Espíritu este le provocó a él? When he saw the city. Cuando él vio a la ciudad. That was not a normal city, was it, Nacho? No era una ciudad normal. It was a city. Era una ciudad. That not, didn't just have idols. Que no únicamente tenía ídolos. It was a city given over to idols. Era una ciudad que estaba dada sobre los ídolos. Those idols had become a part of their culture. Esos ídolos eran parte de su cultura. Their everyday life was affected by those idols. La vida diaria cotidiana estaba afectada por estos ídolos. Their traditions. Las tradiciones. Their holiday. Los días festivos. The start of the day to the end of the day. Empezar el día al terminar el día. What they did on the weekends Lo que hacían en los fines de semana was affected by those idols estaba afectado por estos ídolos and their devotion la devoción de ellos to those idols a estos ídolos. And as a result, Como resultado, Paul was provoked. Pablo estaba preocupado. And notice the words that follow the word provoked. Y estas palabras que siguen la palabra preocupado. With in him. En el mismo. When you go to Acts 2, verse 37. Cuando vamos a Hechos 2, 37. Peter is preaching. Pedro, Pedro está predicando. His word was affected to his listeners. La palabra de él estaba afectando a los, a los que escuchaban. Unfortunately, not all. Desafortunadamente, no todos. But a great number. Pero un número muy grande. When they heard. Cuando ellos escucharon. They were cut to their heart. Estaban cortados en el corazón. Paul was Pablo cut to the heart. Les cortó el corazón con esas palabras. As he witnessed all of these people and their devotion to idols, cuando él fue a toda esta gente con los ídolos en devoción, he was cut to the heart. Same word. Esta palabra fue cortada a su corazón también. He was affected emotionally. Él estaba afectado emocionalmente. And it was a shock to me. Era muy asombroso para mí. When Nacho and I traveled to when, Colombia. Cuando Nacho y yo viajamos a Colombia. If you would again, those of you who have been to Central America, Latin America, you raise your hand again. Was it a shock to y'all to see that idolatry? I'm sure it was. It infects you because their whole life 
is affected by that. You go to one town after another. There's the cathedral. This is one of the older ones. And there's what cathedrals look like on the inside. You can almost guess. And there'll be some more pictures here. But truly it was a city given over to idols. But because Paul had to wait from verse 16, we read in verse 17. Si leemos el verso 17. Therefore he reasoned. Por eso él está razonando. In the synagogue. En las sinagogas. Because there were Jews. Porque ya había judíos. And also Gentile proselytes. Y también gentiles proselytes. But he also had Gentiles on the outside who were worshiping those idols. Pero también gentiles afuera que estaban adorando estos ídolos. So this gave him opportunity in the marketplace daily. Esto le dio la oportunidad diario en, en la marqueta, en, en los mercados. To reason with them. Para te, razonar con ellos. Obviously, when we went to Colombia. Así como nosotros fuimos a Colombia. We had the opportunity. Tuvimos esta oportunidad. To reason razonar con ellos with all and any who would hear us con todos los que nos escuchaban because we were concerned porque nos preocupábamos about their souls acerca de sus almas that's why Paul took the time and the opportunity to reason with people por eso Pablo tomó el tiempo y la oportunidad de razonar con ellos and as New Testament Christians y como nuevo uh, cristianos del Nuevo Testamento as the church of our Lord como la iglesia de nuestro Dios. We also should be concerned. Debemos estar preocupados. So that we will be motivated. Para que estemos motivados. To reason with those that are there. Razonar con todas estas personas. Okay, Marshall, that's a good. We'll pause here. Don't, don't go away. <laughs> One of the things that Nacho, you and I agreed and we talked about a little bit about this truth that we learned in Colombia. Same truth you learn from Acts 17. People are people. Amen. Well, things were different in relationship to what Paul saw there. He was there with people. And wherever Paul would go in his travels, as you learn from your studies and with Paul on Wednesday night, in reference to Paul and his travels, wherever you go in the world, and those of you that have traveled can say amen to this, I'm sure, People are people. And that's why in verse 21 we read, For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time. And of course he's talking about being on Mars Hill with the, the idols and where people gathered. And it was also a place that was, was where people could speak. They would spend their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. How many of y'all go to McDonald's in the mornings here in Marshville? Or other restaurants. And what do you see people engaged in? Telling or hearing some new thing. We like to talk and visit, don't we? Most people do, at least. Well, I want you to look at this guy in the slide. He caught my attention. And we are in the, in the cathedrals just on this side of him. And I, I noticed that anybody that walked by, he would can engage in a conversation. And, it, and apparently he's pretty well known in the place. He spent a lot of time while we were there watching him uh, just visiting with people and talking. I don't know what he had to say. I don't know if you heard any of his words or not, no, Nacho. No. But, but it was interesting. And wherever you go, people engage in that. People are people, and that's something that's significant. Even though you go to a foreign country, it's Paul's in a foreign place, people are simply people. And this is the square that man was talking in. On the right is the cathedral, and people were gathered there, sit everywhere. They even had playgrounds for the kids. They had... Uh, restaurants and vendors there in this in this public looked like a park in front of the cathedral and people were going in and out of the cathedral and very much puts me in mind of what Paul engaged in in Athens and notice what Paul says about people in verse 26 and he has made from one blood every nation of men every nation one blood to dwell on all the face of the earth it doesn't matter what color the skin is we're one blood, and truly, people are people. And when people are people, there's this great need to be people who, uh, as Christians, who reason. So Paul took the opportunity, stood up in the midst of the Areopagus, or as the King James says, I believe, Mars Hill, and said, men of Athens. So he's getting the opportunity to speak to these men. He says, I perceive 
that in all things you are very religious. Nacho, is Columbia a religious country? Very. Very. Are they Catholic? Hmm? Are they Catholic? Very Catholic, very religious. Full of traditions that they've had for years. But they're religious, just as they were in Paul's day. But what does he mean by religious? Were they religious in the fact that they were following the truth of the gospel? No. No. Verse 23, for as I was passing through and considering the, notice, the objects of your worship. That's what we observed, wasn't it? Amen. Objects of worship. There Paul was witnessing their object. We also did as well. Here you see a cathedral, and I wish you would, uh, could see it huge, but it doesn't take much looking at this. Maybe some of you have been in these places, but there are idols everywhere. Works of art everywhere. And it's not just that they're there to picture eyes or to bring to remember certain biblical events. They're there to be worshipped and recognized as something special. And that kind of blows my mind how that they can, can have in their mind that that statue has any realism to their chosen people that they worship. But they're full of objects. But look at what Paul said to those people on Mars Hill. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold, silver, or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Nacho, one of the things that Fernando did for us is he would stand, we were teaching, and he would read the scripture. Can you read that in Spanish for us? Sure. Por eso, desde que somos relacionados con God, a través, no deben de pensar que la divina naturaleza viene de oro, plata o piedra. Algunas cosas están hechas por el hombre. Now, how many of you understood what Nacho said? Does anybody speak Spanish? I know Anthony does a little bit. Anybody else? A little bit? Good. Well, I, I, I know what he spoke because it's there. But here's something interesting. Many of us didn't understand what he said. There's a whole world in Central America, well, South America, that doesn't understand this verse. But it's not just there. I had opportunity many years ago to spend a couple months, two trips, a month apiece in India. And there, again, I was overtaken by the idolatry of the Hindu religion. And it was very obvious as I'd look at men sit in the dirt and carve out their idols that they didn't understand this, they didn't know this, but look how clear it is. What does Paul say? We are the offspring of God. We ought not to think that the divine nature, it's in reference to God. You can't form God and Jesus or even the Holy Spirit in any form like gold, silver, or stone or something that's done in, in reference to those things by the art and man's devising and say there's the divine nature. But not so that's what they were doing. Exactly. And one of the primary focuses of their work and their artwork is in reference to the Virgin Mary. Kathy's telling me it's 11.30, so we're going to finish this. Now, tonight, I want you to come back because we're going to talk about virgins. May I stop you for a second? Mm -hmm. May I say something? Yes, go ahead. What I want to tell you is very quick. You can see so many statues in the streets, in the homes, but you see the people have such a reverence for these statues, for these saints, virgins, or whatever they might have. But it's, I mean, it's unbelievable how you see they bow their heads and do this thing with them, and 
I was Catholic, I know I tell you this many times. I can understand that. But we try to tell them it's very, very hard. They open the heart and minds to accept the truth. Yes, and if you happen to be here this morning, you have a Catholic background, you understand these objects of a devotion greater than I do, and you may have questions about what we're saying, and we would like to study with you about this because that's why we went to Columbia. It's because of what traditional religion has done where they can embody statues with a divine nature, and we'll talk more about that tonight. But divine nature is not in idols. As you look at Psalms 115, starting verse 4, reference to idols. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. There is the problem. They have mouths, but they speak not. They have eyes, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses they have, but they don't smell. Verse 7, they have hands. They handle not feet. They walk not. They can speak. They, they neither speak through their throat. They don't move, talk, speak, do anything. They're sitting there doing nothing. And look at verse 8. This is the King James. They that make them are like unto them. An idol is as dumb as you can get, meaning they have no function. What happens when a person gets caught up in a tradition that is devoted to, whether it's Hinduism or the traditional Catholicism of Central America, they get devoted to nothing that can move, speak, hear, and they become just like that. They're not functional spiritually. And look at this. So is everyone that trusts in them. And, and the King James uses the word trust F. Because that ending, that's to show it's a continuous action. They put their trust continually in those things that are nothing. They have no real function. True trust is in God daily. Because it is God who gives to all life, breath, and all things. Verse 25. It is God who made the world. He is the one we put our trust in. And let me tell you this, in Columbia, Kathy and I learn to trust in God probably a lot more than we have recently in America. And the traffic over there, if you travel different parts of the world, you know, it can be uh, challenging. And our brother Fernando, bless his heart, that we help support there, is doing a wonderful work and working hard. That brother used to drive a taxi. Does that tell you something? And we're, we're packed into a little old van, and, and he is in and out of traffic, left and right, stopping fast, side to side. And then we had the challenges of there being too much on one road and everybody trying to squeeze into one place. And we were in this van that I pointed out this morning is less than uh, what it should be. It's, it's not very big. It's not the size of an American vehicle. And we're many times nine of us traveling for a long way up and down hills and mountains in this vehicle uh, going side to side. And we've encountered roads like this where there's lots of curves on the mountains going up and down the hills, and I was grateful that the van had enough power to get up a hill. We were worried about the brakes going down a hill and around the curves because many of those curves were uh, around like this scene, which is the curve that we were getting ready to go down. There is a long way down the side of a mountain if you happen to go off the curve. And what surprised me, they had a little bit of railing past where you could go off, and as you see this yellow railing, if you can, you'll see that there's marks on it where people have run into it. If you'd happen to swerve or get shoved off or be on your cell phone, you'd have a really big ride down the side of a mountain. So we had to trust God. But we can because we can look at the evidence outside of this building as we go home that God truly is the creator of the world. And we saw that same evidence in this country. Beautiful country, growth with trees and flowers everywhere. But clearly... God is in control. He's the God of heaven, and he's not worshipped, verse 25, with man's hands. And here's another factor that we take comfort in is why we can trust in God and why we should have that trust is because God is not far away. Have you ever felt alone? Nacho, in Columbia, did you ever feel alone? No. You had brethren, but you also had God. And Nacho had a trust in that God. 
I know he did because he was in the same vehicle with Fernando. And as you look at the thought, he's not far from each uh, one of us. Kathy had quite a time with Fernando trying to get him to understand we, we didn't like driving that way. But we survived with God's help and things went well. But one of the things we learned, and I'm going to close with this, the time of ignorance God overlooked. As Paul told the people on Mars Hill, but because of what Christ did on the cross, things change. Because now God commands all men everywhere to repent. And that's important because he's, by the surety of the fact that Christ was resurrected from the tomb, the stone was rolled away, as mentioned earlier in our taking the Lord's Supper, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead that what? Man must repent. Now, in verse 32, there's a reason why man must repent. Because there is going to be the resurrection of the dead. It's an inescapable reality. There will be a resurrection from the dead. That's clear. And with that resurrection, there is a time appointed for man to face judgment. So men die once, and then there is judgment. Now, this is our brother Fernando and his sister Marilena. And we are in a cemetery where his mother is buried. And tell us real quick about his mother, Fernando's mother. She was one of the early converts in Colombia. One of the first converts. And she was Catholic, very, very Catholic. She don't want to hear anything about it. I was a preacher for the United States, and we started to talk to her. And she said, I can listen, you teach me the Bible. Don't ask me to change my religion. He said, don't worry about it, don't ask you for that, you listen. And he was patient with her. Eventually she said, I want to get baptized. And, <laughs> excuse me, she got baptized and she was faithful to the day she died, 91 years old. And she, she lived a long life, was buried in this cemetery, and we went to see her grave. He wanted to show us his mom's grave. But there was another grave there. He also showed us. See the, see the blue arrow? That's his brother. His brother was also a Christian, and we're thankful for that. His brother ran a restaurant. And one of the ladies that had a business would send her employees over daily to eat at his restaurant and things went well for a while but then she got where she couldn't pay for the food that her workers were eating and so when Fernando's brother approached her about getting the money to pay him he needed the money and she said I won't pay you in fact I will have you killed well he thought she, it was just an idle threat needless to say it was not he was killed, murdered, just for a few dollars. But he died a Christian, and so did his mother. Why is that important? Because one day the graves are going to open up. Christ is going to come again. All their graves are going to hear his voice and come forth. And that will even include the people that are in these graves where these people are looking at. That's the family of the Escobars. One of those graves is Pablo Escobar. If you know anything about him, he was a cartel leader that was one of the wealthiest drug cartel leaders in the world. And he made his money selling drugs to America. You can look at some of the documentaries that are on TV and YouTube about him and his life. He was quite a ruthless man who had a lot of power in the city of Medellin where we work. And one of the interesting things about this man was they called Pablo Escobar the Robin Hood of Medellin because he would take the drug money he had and he would build people homes. In fact, there's a whole area that this bears his name. He would do good things. He even got elected into government for a while, but he was very corrupt, and you can imagine where that will, um, led him. In fact, he was killed finally at the age of 44. As you look at these two graves, it's interesting. Both 
are going to face the resurrection and then judgment. One lived, well, she was how old? You're not sure? 91. 91. The other only 44. Pablo Escobar. One was Fernando's mother. And Fernando, is the, if you weren't here this morning, was, is the preacher that we uh, send uh, support to and, and Nacho's worked with for many years. And his mother died a faithful Christian. Escobar died a criminal. And after doing some very cruel and horrible things to a lot of people. The question I have for you this morning, if you could pick one of those that you would like to be, who would it be? Would you want to die a faithful Christian or a criminal evil? There's no choice for me. There's only one choice, right, Nasha? That's why when we would teach in Columbia, we would present what we're presenting to you this morning. If you're here and you're not a Christian, we don't want you to die not a Christian. We want you to die and have a place in heaven prepared for that judgment. And what has to happen, Nacho, in order for someone to become a Christian? Is obey. Obey. The plan of salvation is very simple. It's laid out. It's, it's easy to read. It's easy to understand. And when a person obeys the gospel then they have that wonderful privilege to live faithful, looking forward to that crown of life. Let me ask you this once again. Where do you fit in? If you were to pick one, which one would describe you? Are you prepared? Have you obeyed the gospel? If not, we're going to stand. Jerry's going to lead us in a song of invitation. If we can help you anyway, if you have any questions about anything this morning, and we'd like for us to study with you, please let us know. As we stand and sing, would you come this morning? Child of wheat. Rick and Nacho, good job. Our closing song, 624 in your book, first and last verses. Following this, we'll have our shepherd's prayer. Thank you, the Lord, just kindly entreating wonders on the mountain of Thrace. Come to me. Upon the mountain, 
quick announcement before we have a prayer. Next Sunday, uh, we're having a special contribution. Everything over budget will be put into the building fund. And as you can see, we're, we're moving quite uh, along with it. But uh, we're at a point where we've, we've got to pay for some stuff uh, before we move any further. So if you you'll want to give a special contribution, just write it on your check and, uh, you know, it'll be used in the proper manner. Thank you. Let's bow. Our most kind, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We thank you, Father, for the blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day. But especially today, we're reminded of your greatness we're reminded of your son and the Holy Spirit Father that made sure that we have your word written in a language that we can easily understand and Father as we were seeing pictures of brothers and sisters in Columbia we pray that you will be with these people as well. And we know that you will. Father, help us to always remember that your kingdom is throughout our whole earth. And may we always be grateful for that. Father, we enjoy many privileges in this country. And we appreciate them. And Father, we ask that you would help protect those. Be with our president, Father. Help him to realize the need to look to you for guidance. Be with our military leaders, Father. Bless them. Help them as they plan out missions that the objectives to those missions would be clear cut. That there would be things that could be obtained quickly with as little loss of life as possible. Father, the freedoms that we enjoy in this country have cost many lives. We know how precious they are. And Father, as great as these freedoms are, they pale in comparison to the freedom that we have through your Son and his death on the cross, the freedom from sin the opportunity to spend eternity with you. As the song we were just singing spoke about our sins being like crimson and yet his blood washed them white as snow. Father, we have many in our congregation who are ailing, who need your hand laid upon them, Father, to heal them if that is your will. And Father, help us to always realize that your will is what is best. 
And may we always yield to you and to your will. Be with those who are recovering from surgery. May they make full and quick recovery. Be with those who have surgery upcoming, Father. Bless them, bless the surgeons, that they would have the skills necessary. Father, we pray for those who are taking cancer treatments, and we pray that the treatments would work as they're intended to. And Father, we ask that you would be with those who have lost loved ones. Give them comfort. That can only come from you, Father. And give us wisdom to know how to answer people in such a way as to encourage them to want to follow you and to follow your will. And Father, all these things we pray through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.